If I look really excited, it's because I am. I'm excited that you're with us. Love you guys. We're here for you. But I'm really excited today also because Joseph Pierce, the man, the myth, is joining us <laughs> to talk about, I, I, I guess, second to the Bible, the most popular book of all time. And if that's not true, it should be true. We'll be talking about unlocking the Lord of the Rings and how your Catholic faith is the key to understanding that incredible work. Thanks for being with us. The man and the myth. I like the man and the myth, exactly. Yeah, yeah. For that. That's my new label. Yeah. <laughs> That'll be on his website. Yeah, it's going to be the first. J Pierce. J P E A R C E dot C O. The man. The man and the, and the, the myth. Or he's just go with the man and the myth dot com or something like that. Yep. Uh, one of my regrets it's gonna the, is. It's going to be the first sentence in my bio from now on. Yeah, so <laughs> the same sentence you buy? Yes. Joseph Pierce is the man and the Says Christophanic. Says so yeah, Christophanic. Got a blurb. To which people will say, who? <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so, Sam. I don't think <laughs> Brother, so. One of my regrets is not living closer to you and Susanna. Well, we had a great family. time. That was great blessing. Unexpected blessing. We're so pleased you could find time for us. Because normally, you, you, like me, you're going giving a talk. Yeah. You don't have time to go and visit even with friends. So we're really pleased that you managed to... You roughed it with us rather than staying in a yeah, hotel. Yeah, well, I, 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 uh, I heard we're the best gin and tonics in town well, were. Well, I hope we didn't disappoint. <laughs> <laughs> you, you did not disappoint, brother. <laughs> Praise God. Hey, before, before we dive into the Lord of the Rings, which, um, man, I just love the Lord of the Rings. I, it's, it's, it's captured so many hearts. Just given, yep. there, there's, there's things I've learned about my faith, about the spiritual journey through that, yep. through that story. Yep. That has uh, taught things I've read from saints and like and clear expositions from theologians that are just stating truths. But when you state them through stories, like oh man. Uh, before we dive into that though, and and you help us unlock that with the Catholic faith, um, I'm just fascinated by you as a prolific author. How many books have you written? Uh, it's somewhere in the region of thirty. Around, no. Over thirty, but who's counting? Right. I, mean, I lost count a few dozen ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> the reason this fascinates me is because I, I love speaking, I love doing video work, I love making programs. W when you craft a book, to me that starts to feel like I'm, I'm taking out the hammer and chisel and it's just next level perfectionism. Uh, how the heck does a person write over 30 books? Is it, is it something that comes naturally for you or do you feel the pain that I feel when I'm trying to write a book? <laughs> Uh, I, I, I would say, I, my, my wife will tell you that I don't do many, many things very well. Um, <laughs> but writing, writing is something I've always made me do. It's been always fairly easy. I mean, not easy in terms of not being work, but I don't get writer's block. And I do find it very easy to come up with um, uh, a chapter, uh, chapter plan as, as the outline and then work around that and, and, and adapt it as I go. And it works. I mean, it just keeps working, and I, and I thank God for it. It's just a gift. I mean, but it's Praise another, God. Yeah, amen. So it just comes naturally. Yeah, it's just, it's, I, I, yeah, there aren't many things I do well, but writing it seems to come very easily for me. Whether I'm writing short pieces for online journals or full-length books, it just, it happens. Are, are you uh, in, a, in a zone that's very focused or very jovial when you're writing? Are you having fun? Or is it really serious where you're telling the kids, get away from my room? Like, what's what's the <sighs> mental state that you're in when you're, cranking books out. Uh, well, again, I've got to quote the great authority in my life, which is uh, Susanna, my wife. Uh, you know, the, <laughs> I was going to say, uh, gonna uh, say uh, his uh, wife, <laughs> for sure. I mean, she, she'd always say that I'm never happier than when I'm just left alone to write a book, and that's true. And I, 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 I would describe it as exhausting and exhilarating. So it's, it's hard okay. work, it's very intense, but it's also very rewarding, and I'm very in the zone, and, I'm, and I, I, I don't want to be disturbed with other stuff. You know, I need to be getting on with it, particularly yeah. with book writing. Now, writing an article, you know, an essay for a magazine, you just need two hours. But if you're writing a book, you've got to have the, you've got to get into it in the day. So you know, it takes an hour or two to get up to speed, and then right. and then you get your flow, right? But you know, if you've only got two or three hours anyway, by the time you're up to speed, you've got to stop, and that's very frustrating. So yeah. Uh, yeah, I try to set whole days aside when I'm writing a book. There's good. I mean, that, that's probably why it's hard for me. I'm just, hey, look a squirrel. You know, that's kind of my, <laughs> which also makes me good at what I do in different ways. It's a blessing and a curse. Uh, <laughs> But that, that deep work, have you read the book Deep Work? No. Yeah, I mean, no. it's, it's, it's from a, a slightly Eastern religion perspective, perspective that comes out. So uh, take it with a grain of salt, but it is a great book for learning tips for those for whom this doesn't come naturally on how to just make sure you focus. And then yeah. if, if you're derailed, that derail people often just allow into their lives. They, hey, someone just called me. Right. Uh, they think it's no big deal. It takes at least 20 minutes to get re-railed. Right. 
yeah. back where you were. Yeah. So that's uh, good advice well, for me when well, you say you need hours just yeah, to well, get up to speed. On a pretty practical level, Chris, what I do is um, uh, I either turn the inbox in off altogether or I, I, I mute the computer so I don't hear when there's new in, new email coming in because I want to get the, oh, the Word beautiful. document to write. So I, 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 I deliberately distance myself from distractions. I turn the phone down. Wow. Um, so I'm not going to hear a phone call coming. I close the door to the office. That's the sign for the rest of the family that I don't want to be disturbed. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, and I, and I just become focused. Do you read a ton too as an author? Again, it depends upon the book. Some books take much more research than others. Um, so yes, there's obviously a research period before you start. And I like that because it means it's not monotonous. So you have, say, a full-length book, You know, 40% of the time is doing the research and then 60% is writing. So just yeah. when you're getting fed up with research because you've been doing it, reading, 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 you go back to then the you break and you do the writing. And then you probably, by the time you finish the book, you need a break from the writing. You can start researching. The what are you book. reading for fun right now? I'm just curious. Uh, actually, I've just started reading on a plane coming here, um, uh, a novel that um, Ignatius Press published called Barely a Crime a few years ago. Okay. Which is very, it's a thriller. It's a thriller set sort of in Northern Ireland, and, and I, my, some, some of my past is, is there. Um, so right. I'm enjoying that, but I'm also coming to the end of, of rereading Father Elijah by, oh, uh, by Michael D. O'Brien. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I always try to have at least one book recreation, nothing to do with work, just when I've got it's an hour or so in the evening. Yep. Just reading for fun. I just got done with Lord of the World, and I'm starting uh, Pride and Prejudice. Oh, good for you. I want to be one of the few men. Exactly. I'm actually thinking of getting a Prius to read it in, just so I could break all the molds. Yeah, and then... yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, real, real men love Jane Austen. That, yeah. that, that should be a slogan somewhere. Real men love Jane Austen. That's awesome. So let's dive into the book that you wrote. Uh, Frodo's Journey, Discovering the Hidden Meaning of the Lord of the Rings. And again, uh, J. Pierce, P-E-A-R-C-E dot C-O. That's where they can get your book. Uh, discovering the Hidden Meaning of the Lord of the Rings. Um, when did you discover that you loved Lord of the Rings? When did you first pick up that book? Well, that's the sort of question that's always, uh, it's, a, it's a conversation stopper because I actually first read the Lord of the Rings during my second prison sentence. Really? Which is obviously, that's another discussion. No, we're going to come back a whole show on that. Uh, okay. Incredible story. Man. Yeah, so obviously oh I was gosh. a bad boy when I was younger, before my conversion, and got yeah. myself into trouble. So I did, Lord of the Rings is always a book that's this thick, and I always thought, I've, I've got to read it, I've got to read it. And then you look at the size of it, and you think, ah, oh, not, not yet, too busy, too busy. What better time than and when sitting in prison? Stuck in prison with plenty of time in your hands, so that's when I read it first of all. And I didn't get all of the Catholic dimension first time. I, that sort of grew on me. Yeah. But then uh, Tolkien said, and I'm quoting him word for word here, the Lord of the Rings is, of course, a fundamentally religious and Catholic work. So, you know, I wanted to, okay, well, that, let's, let's, let's delve, let's dive, let's go deep. Wow. Uh, and see of how, course. How, how much Catholicism is there, right? And it's just, it, the whole thing is awash with the faith. Did, what, did you start with The Hobbit? Did you start with Silmarillion? Did you start with... I read The Lord of the Rings before I read The Hobbit. Uh, okay. I can't remember if I read the summer reading before I read before I read The Hobbit or not. I can't remember the order, but Lord of the Rings was my introduction to Tolkien. I think a lot of people work backwards like that. Yes, that, that's what I I did too. But I would I wouldn't advise people to start with the summer reading because it's it's heavy. It's almost quasi scriptural in its style. I mean, yeah. it, it is meant to be the sort of the Elvish scripture. So the Ainulindal, the creation story, harmonizes with Genesis, um, and so yeah. there's a lot of deep theology, but it's also written that very high almost biblical style. Yeah. It's not accessible to many people. So yeah. I always advise, you know, Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings first. Yeah, beautiful. Now, I'm, I'm guessing that you you didn't pick up on the Catholic themes while you were in prison, unless you had had your conversion already. I hadn't had Did my it, conversion, but I was, I, was, I was on the journey. Was this, so was this part of this, the, it, the journey there? It was part of the journey. Reading the Lord of the Rings is one of the milestones on that journey. But I was reading, by the time that that second prison sentence, I was reading Chesterton and Newman. I think I read Newman for the first time in, in prison, Apologia wow. Pro Vita Sua, and Aquinas, I think, for the first time in prison too. So wow. I, by the second prison sentence, I was on the way, and Lord of the Rings was certainly part of the journey. Praise God. Okay, when did you discover that, that, that Catholic element, that beautiful quote again, Lord of the Rings is, of course, fundamentally a religious and Catholic work. Um, did you, did you discover that after the fact, or were you picking up on these themes as you read it and thinking, wow, this is leading me to faith? You know, I think when I first read it, I was unaware. Um, and like most people who read The Lord of the Rings, if they're not Christians and don't get it, uh, they, they're aware they're reading something healthy and something deep, mm. something edifying, something which is virtuous, even if they haven't really defined what virtue is. So I'd put it on that level. In other words, it takes you from a position of agnosticism or atheism into a position of the acceptance of virtue in an objective sense. Mm. And that's a major first step for many people who aren't Christians. So Lord of the Rings is a very powerful evangelical tool. 
uh, for, for non-Christians. So if you try to, show, try to give them a copy of the Bible, they'll run a mile. Right, right. Or anything overtly Christian, they'll run a mile. Now, Tolkien and Lewis said, we live in such an anti-Christian age that you have to get past those watchful dragons. You know, that basically mm. the, the dragons are watching. If they see you're trying to evangelize, they come down. Um, mm. But if the Lord of the Rings just gets past those watchful dragons. <laughs> That's awesome. Yes. I, I, it's that worldview that it gives people. And again, this is why it's a fundamentally a Catholic and Christian work. Uh, all the postmodern uh, authorship is it, it, it gives you, it comes from a worldview where there's no blueprint, there's no framework or structure that's intelligible behind the story. No, but what's necessary, uh, of course, for people to grow in wisdom uh, and strength and virtue uh, is to learn to lay down your life for your brother. Mm. Uh, learning, learning the art of self-sacrifice is the beginning of all wisdom and strength. So that's the, that's the essence of love, of course, is to lay down our life for others. So he teaches us to love, you know, uh, in, in, in a world which, which is now completely and utterly infatuated with, besotted with pride, basically putting yourself first, doing your own thing, telling other people to go to hell if they try to stop you from doing it. This is very, very countercultural. Mm. It's basically saying, no, you're not, you're not going to grow as a person unless you learn to sacrifice yourself for others. And unless you're reading Silmarillion, you're not hearing God mentioned overtly. No. And, not, not and yet all. you can't avoid the, the framework of yeah. this is obviously from a godly... Uh, so when, so in, the, in one of the darkest moments of the story, when, 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 when Samwise Gamgee looks, you know, looks up and he says, or he sings actually, above all shadows rides the sun. Right? And, and there, God's not mentioned, but the shadow is quite clearly evil. Right, That's, that's the shadow, Mordor, uh, Melkor, etc., Sauron. But above all shadows, above all darkness, above all evil, evil rides the sun. In other words, there's a goodness, a God that transcends and supersedes and is ultimately mm. more powerful than any power of darkness. I mean, that's, that's at the heart of the story. And somehow it's little schleps like the hobbits that, that partner with God and turn the tides of history. And that's like it's an invitation to all of us. Yeah, it's the exaltation <laughs> of the humble. Right, it's not. It's not. It's not the. It's not the great and the good that everyone lords as being powerful. That the, mm. the, the ultimate heroes. It's the small men. Mm. And the reason that they that that Sauron, you know, the Dark Lord, doesn't discover the ring is because he doesn't care about humble people, small people, and they're not on his radar. He doesn't even know that. He doesn't even know the Shire mm. exists. Why would he bother with those little people? Right, Gosh. he's he's got his all his eyes on the great, and therefore the ring is safe because he's not looking there. Satan was not looking at Nazareth for something to happen. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And that's oh. it. Again, Annunciation, I'm sure you know this. Yes. But, uh, you know, the, the ring is destroyed on March the 25th, which is the date of the Annunciation, uh, and also the date hi historically, according to tradition, of the crucifixion. Yeah. So, you know, put the Annunciation, the Incarnation, and the crucifixion uh, together um, uh, to, with, the, with the resurrection, you can have redemption. What's destroyed then is sin. And what's original sin? The one sin to rule them all in the darkness bind them. So the one sin to rule them all and the one ring to, to rule them all are both destroyed in the same significant date of March the 25th. <laughs> I mean, it's all there. Oh, man. That's so cool. Um, all right. right, let's. I, I just want to dive into a couple of things to help people because we, we only have, uh, gosh, I wish we had three hours on this. You could buy the book, by the way. You need to get the book, right, to help you unlock this. But we're going to give you a couple cheats, a couple keys for, for your reading of Lord of the Rings to help you discern these Catholic, these Catholic themes. Uh, Let's start at the start. The creation narrative of the Silmarillion. That if you're going to be a true Lord of the Rings nerd, you have to read the Silmarillion. Yeah. So basically, it begins the opening line of the of the Ainu and Dala, which is the creation story at the beginning of the Silmarillion. It's the Elvis Genesis. It begins with in the beginning. So the well, same sounds familiar. Same same words. The opening book of Genesis and the opening book of St John's Gospel in Principio. In the beginning, there was the one. Mm. Capital O, uppercase O. So immediately, first few words, we know that the, the Middle Earth is created, and it's not an atheistic cosmos, it's not a polytheistic cosmos, it's a monotheistic cosmos with one God. And then, and then we're told his name is Uluvata, the All-Father, the Father of all. The All-Father. Yeah, uh, and then basically he presents to the archangelic beings, this is before any of us exist, before any physical cosmos exists, presents to the angelic beings the great music of the cosmos. Uh, so you have this understanding of cosmos as the music of the spheres, this great work, God as the artist, as the poet, as the musician, as the composer. But then he doesn't. He says to the angels, he doesn't say hearken, he doesn't say listen, he says play. 
Mm. In other words, you know, this is the great music. This is my divine will. This is providence. But you have free will, mm. you know. And then, of course, you have the the mightiest of the angels, Melchor, uh, whose name is Mighty One. He Which doesn't is exactly want exactly to... like Lucifer. Exactly like most... Lucifer. So Lucifer is the light bearer, the brightest of the angels. Melchor is the mighty one, the mightiest of the angels. When when Lucifer falls from heaven, and in the Book of Isaiah, you know, how has that fallen? Lucifer star star of the morning. Um, that. Uh, that he forfeits the name Lucifer because he's no longer the light bearer. He's the mm -hmm. prince of darkness. And he's now known as Satan, which is Hebrew for enemy or adversary. When Melchor falls, Whoa. the mighty one, he forfeits that name. He's now known as Morgoth, which is Elvish mm -hmm. for enemy. So Tolkien is a linguist playing games here. It's the same person, right? You're playing with different languages. This is the fall of Satan we're talking about here. Mm. So that, that basically evil enters the cosmos because of the satanic uh, demonic uh, rebellion. And then that, of course, has its ramifications throughout human history and the history of Middle Earth. You know, I've, I've interviewed a, an exorcist a few times. And the insights about how whenever the devil tries to go outside the plan of God, instead of just crushing him into oblivion and non-existence, God is so powerful that he includes anything the devil tries to do in his plan. Yep. And, and that's, that's, it, that's Melkor. Yeah, it's exactly. In fact, God says to Melkor in the Silmarillion that, 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 that Melkor has to understand that there's no theme, however violent or ugly or prideful. No, that, no musical theme. No that musical he tries theme to make. But coming into the great music. That, that the God will not weave back into the central theme in ways more beautiful beyond Melkor's imagining. So there's nothing evil that Satan can do that's that awesome. God will not turn into something more beautiful beyond Satan's own imagining. The, I mean, it's almost a mystical level of insight that this guy had as an author into the nature of evil. Yeah, he was a lifelong practicing Catholic. We need to remember that. A lifelong practicing devout Catholic who was a professor of philology at Oxford University. He was a smart man, uh, but he knew the difference between cleverness and wisdom. Uh, he says in The Hobbit, you know, that the, uh, he says that the, the goblins, the orcs, make no uh, beautiful things, but many clever ones. Uh, mm. especially devices for killing large numbers of people at once and mass weapons of mass destruction. Well, so he knows, well. it, he knows the difference between cleverness and wisdom, right, and, and, oh, and yeah. holiness, and, and, and this plays itself out in his works. Why is it that that story, that allegory, I mean, this, maybe this is a rhetorical question, why, why is it that that gets truth into my soul more effectively than just someone just, well, here's the truth, here's the nature of evil. What is it? Well, What's the magic of this? <laughs> the magic of it is actually the magic of... The parable. I mean, Jesus yeah. Christ sanctifies storytelling uh, because he teaches us most of his most powerful lessons through the telling of stories. Yeah. The prodigal son is a fictional narrative. I mean, the prodigal son never yeah. existed in history, nor did his father, nor did his brother, nor did the pigs, right? It's a fictional narrative. And yet the prodigal son is so powerful mm. that we don't say, for, th for 2,000 years, when everyone's ever heard that story or read that story, we don't say the prodigal son is like us. Mm. We say we are like the prodigal son. In other words, the prodigal son, even though he's a fictional character, is the archetype of which we are types. Mm. I mean, this is the power of story, and, and Christ himself sanctifies it by teaching those lessons. And of course, what's the most powerful lesson he teaches us? By being in the story himself. Mm. So God's not some distant figure we have to understand through abstract concepts. Uh, he's someone who's concrete, incarnate, who comes down and shows us the divine in his person. You know, I, one of the reasons, too, that this is so powerful, storytelling, and that Things like good books, like Lord of the Rings for your kids, the, the impact it has on their soul. Uh, when you recall an image from a story, all the lessons are like, they're all right there. They're, yep. they're present to your intellect yes. in a way that sequential uh, communication of facts can't, can, can't do it. No, exactly. You know? and, I, and I think it's because we are in a story. You know, mm. history is his story. All of us are homo viator. We're on a journey. Now, if, if our life is a journey, ultimately a pilgrimage to heaven, if our life's a journey, it's also a story. Right, because we start in you know at the very beginning at our own incarnation, our mm. own conception. Uh, then we have the in utero period, and then we have our life story, life story. So mm. we are all in a story. So of course we're going to understand reality in terms of story because we're part of that story. Mm. Hallelujah! Uh, another key beautiful theme that's that's really Catholic is that that spiritual theme of of attachment. You know, you, all the great mystics of the church. Uh, it, the spiritual life is all about detachment, not in a way where we become like Buddha and don't care, but uh, letting go of things so that we're free to, to, to love. Instead of self-negation, it's the path of self-actualization through love, right? Yeah, absolutely. And that there's that spiritual battle that's, the, I think, it's the central theme of Lord of the Rings. And, and The Hobbit, 
right? Uh, and, and there's a similarity here between between Bilbo and Smog and his spill, spill that yeah. thread out for us. Well, again, again you're absolutely true. So um, the, the ring teaches us that the thing possessed possesses the possessor. We the become thing possessed possesses, possesses the, the possessor. possessor. We become possessed by our possessions, right? Mm. If, if we attach to them, we can't actually escape from them. They become shackles. Um, and in the in, in the Hobbit, you're completely correct. The whole of the Hobbit really is a meditation, a contemplation of St. Matthew's Gospel, where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. Mm. And at the beginning of the Hobbit, um, Bilbo Baggins is trapped in his comfort zone. Mm. He's a creature of comfort, a, addicted <laughs> to the creature comforts. You know, and so that's why Gandalf says you have to go on an adventure. You have mm. to get out of here. You have to leave your possessions behind. You have to basically lay everything aside um, and go on this adventure because it will be good for you. Um, and at the end of the story, you know, mm. Gandalf says, you're not the hobbit you were, mm. uh, you know, because he's not. And, and, and it's very symbolic. When he, when he returns back to the Shire after the adventure, uh, they're setting all of his possessions mm. because they think he's dead, mm. right? They, 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 he's dead, we can sell his possessions. Well, this is a symbolic rising from the dead because the old Bilbo Baggins, the one who was possessed by his possessions, has died. And it's the new mm. resurrected Bilbo Baggins who's freed from his possessions who returns home. Mm. And you've said the only difference between, the real difference between Bilbo and Smog, it's a, it's a question of scale. <laughs> but um <laughs> Exactly, yeah, you can't be a good pun. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so Smaug lives in, you know, Smaug's a big dragon living under a mountain, and it's no it's no coincidence that Bilbo Baggins lives under hill. Under right? hill. So, he's, so it's, it's just there's two, just the difference in scale. Yeah, yeah. There, there was one time where, where uh, Tolkien really uh, showed his hand, with worm tongue, with the naming of worm tongue, with the treatment of worm tongue. This is not just a battle between good guys and bad guys. This is a battle between uh, good people who who follow God and and demons and demonic forces. Uh, yeah. Spill that out for us. Well, obviously, we need to remember that Tolkien was a professor of Anglo-Saxon, mm. uh, a linguist at uh, Oxford University. So the language of the Anglo-Saxons is the language of Beowulf, for instance, uh, and the old English word, the Anglo-Saxon word for dragon, is worm. W-Y-R-M. So worm tongue means dragon tongue or serpent tongue, right? And so, um, and we, in the exchange with Gandalf and Theoden and worm tongue, Gandalf says, see Theoden, here is a snake. Mm. And then he says to worm tongue, down on your belly, snake. And then, and then worm tongue hisses his reply. I mean, the symbolism mm. uh, that takes us back to, to Genesis is, is palpable. That's so cool. Yeah. The ring. What's the how, through a Catholic perspective? How do I understand this object? Yeah, well, the ring basically uh, is the act of sin. So when you put the ring on, you 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 basically excommunicate yourself from the good world that God made. So you're invisible uh, to the eyes of goodness and the good cosmos, but you become more visible than ever to Salwan uh, because you enter His world. You've excommunicated yourself from from God, and you've entered Satan's dominion. So he can see you, you become invisible everywhere else. So the act of the, putting on the ring is the act of sin. If you, if you put on the ring habitually or keep it on for too long, you shrivel. Um, so this, I, can't, mm. I can't think of a more realistic depiction of the psychological impact of habitual sin than Gollum. That's mm. what happens to our soul. If we allow ourselves to become addicted to sin, we, we shrivel, we shrink, we become a pathetic caricature of the good hobbit God made us to be. So th mm. that, that's that. But then the other side of it is if, it, if, if you are carrying the weight of sin without, actually act, without committing a sin, the ring at this point, if you're a ring bearer and not a ring wearer, the ring becomes the cross. Mm. You are carrying the weight of sin without sinning yourself. You become a, a cross bearer. So Bilbo Baggins and Frodo Baggins, in this sense, as ring bearers are cross bearers and therefore Christ figures. Mm. I was sharing your insight about this with my little girl Clementine from your book and from your videos on this on this topic. She's ten and she she was blown away by that one. As was I. It's profound. You know, it she, is absolutely she, profound. She's like, wow, Jesus was he was bearing the weight of the sin of the world. Just like Frodo toward the end. Who who's the hero? Who's the hero of the of the of the whole narrative? Well, ultimately, you know, uh, I'm I'm reminded here of um of the words of Evening War about Bryce Have Visited, when he says that the theme of the novel is the working of divine grace in, 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 in the lives of closely related individuals. The hero of the Lord of the Rings ultimately is God. Mm. Because it's him that delivers Middle-earth from the power of the ring at the end through providence. 
uh, anchor because Gollum is there. And you might think, oh, hang on a second, Gollum? You know, how, how can Gollum be so, so important? You know, as an a, a agent of grace, because Bill, but Frodo Baggins cannot, de cannot go like this. He can't yeah. throw the ring into, in, into the cracks of doom. Mm. And yeah, that's the easy part, right? But he can't do it because it's too heavy, right? It's too powerful. And, 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 and it's not the, what t t Tolkien is showing us is, is the, the error of Pelagianism. You cannot overcome the power of evil through the triumph of your own will. You need supernatural assistance. You know, which theologians call grace, right? Yeah. So then you think, well, how? Because so a golem is grace, right? The supernatural assistance that comes at the last moment. Yes, because at the beginning of the story, Bilbo Baggins says to Gandalf, "I wish." Sorry, Frodo says to Gandalf, "I wish Uncle Bilbo had destroyed that miserable creature, Gollum, mm. when he had the chance. It's a pity he didn't." And Gandalf says, "Pity? It was pity that stayed his hands, and I'm sure he has a role to play yet." And then later on, Frodo has the chance to kill. Uh, Gollum, and he also says, now I do see him, I do pity him, and he stays his hand. Later, Sam also has the opportunity, and he stays his hand. So on three separate occasions, three separate hobbits uh, obey the most difficult commandment of all, to love, love thine enemy. And if any wow. of them had failed in that commandment, Gollum would not have been there at the crucial moment, and the power of the ring would not have been destroyed. So this was a reward wow. for acts of grace. <laughs> That's awesome. I had never thought of that. Like the hero is is this this one who's not even mentioned yeah. overtly in all three of the of the Lord of the Rings uh, trilogy. That is incredible. Yeah, but who Man. is the Lord of the Rings? The Lord of the Rings ultimately is the Lord of the Lord of the Universe. Yeah, that's the Lord of the Rings. That's it. And, 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 that, and that's the that's 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 the thing that, that Tolkien's playing with, right? Lord of the Rings. Wait, wait, is it Sauron? Right? Mm. No, it's the it's the one ultimately who's who has power over Sauron. Above all shadows rise the sun. It's the Lord of the Universe. Another very Catholic thing is that 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 unseen force is working through a fellowship. Yes, you know, exactly. It's, it's, so in in this regard, it's not just Christian or evangelical work. It's a profoundly Catholic work because we more than any other church, we drive home the, the more importance of the the whole communion of saints, and he's working through our fellowship. Yeah. Who's your favorite character, by the way? <laughs> and, and and everything from Silmarillion through Hobbit through. Well, I, I'm 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 a strange person, Chris. <laughs> Uh, I know. I usually say that my favorite. It's Tulkas the strong, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> we're, going, we're going full nerd here. If you know what I'm talking about, right yeah, now. Yeah, but I'm 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 I am a bit of a nerd. I would say that. But <laughs> my my favorite character is actually Treebeard, and uh, really the end. And that's because I think that Treebeard rep represents tradition. So uh, tradition in terms of the church, tradition in terms of language. Um, so the en old Entish language is all of the etymology of words wow. which Tolkien understood. But then the Ents themselves have been around forever. Right, and they're not hasty. They have occasional councils, but there's no point in, in being hasty because the things of the world change so quickly. So I, I, I see that this is this is Tolkien encapsulating what Chesterton said about tradition being uh, the proxy of the dead and the Beautiful. enfranchisement of the unborn, um, the democracy of the dead. So you know, I, I, oh. that's that's why I actually like Treebeard. I told you oh. I'm a bit strained. Not all that's, the not all the obvious. Uh, that's awesome. People. That's really beautiful. My son Joey, speaking of pres preserving traditions, my son Joey is studying Elvish right now. And oh. he's, he's learned to say the Hail Mary in Elvish, and it's actually gorgeous. And I, you, know, you can't make it anywhere in the business world today without Elvish. You have to. Elvish, have to speak yeah, Elvish. exactly. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm glad he's being very practical. It's a, th <laughs> <laughs> it's a thing. There's the beauty, right? Exactly. Life's it's not it's all about practical. No, it's not. <laughs> I, I, was, I was being ironic and facetious. No, I know. No, it. He's, <laughs> made, he's, made the, he's made the better choice. Yeah, that's yeah. it. That's it. He's chosen the better portion but Tolkien so, uh, by the way you got to read the Silmarillion you know even if you don't read the whole thing just the creation narrative yeah exactly the first two books uh, they should read those first two books anyway yeah. but they, I mean the story of Beren and Luthien in there is also beautiful there's lots of beautiful stories in there yeah, I mean yeah. the thing about it you can dip into it you don't have to read it from page one and you should certainly read the creation story first you're right about that yeah. but after that you can dip into the Silmarillion a little bit at a time if you find it heavy going just read five or six pages at a time and yeah, enjoy it give yourself freedom to have fun with yeah, stuff right exactly people have this this idea maybe from from the way they were educated, like, well, if I pick up the book, I have to finish the book. Right. No, you have to have fun with the book. Yeah. You know, and, and if, if you read a part of the summary and then hop over to Lord of the Rings, that's totally fine. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I, I've got another little tidbit for you. As, yeah, as, talk as, to me. as this is obviously going out in Advent with Christmas on the horizon. Mm -hmm. What many people don't know, even those that do know that the ring was destroyed on March the 25th, what many people don't know is that the uh, Fellowship of the Ring leave Rivendell uh, <laughs> on... Christmas Day December on December the twenty yeah. fifth. So that Frodo Frodo Baggins' journey from Rivendell with the fellowship to Mount Doom Golgotha is the life of Jesus Christ from the moment of his birth 
in Bethlehem to the moment of his death or on Golgotha. Oh, it's profound. Oh, praise God. Thank you so much for this time, man. Well, it's been my pleasure, I, Chris. I, my I just pleasure. love you, and I love your, God bless you, I love your brain. And I, <laughs> I love this book, Frodo's Journey, Discovering the Hidden Meaning of the Lord of the Rings at jpierce, P-E-A-R-C-E dot C-O. And I want to end with this quote from uh, J.R.R. Tolkien. Out of the darkness of my life, so much frustrated, I've put before you the one great thing to love on earth, the blessed sacrament. And he says, there you will find romance, glory, honor, fidelity, and the true way of all your loves on earth. It's the story of the gospel of Jesus Christ that makes every other story beautiful, including the story of your own life. God bless you, friends. Thanks for being with us. Man, wasn't that great? Listen, if you don't want to be happy, be sure not to subscribe. But if you want a more joyful life, the kind of life that God created you for, the kind of life Jesus promised when he said, I came to give you life to the full, then make sure you hit subscribe and share this channel with everybody you know.